particular test pass, and uh, you can see the file for the data. Oh, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks a lot for the organizers. So, um, in this uh, talk, I will present a joint work with uh, Jean-Pierre Florent from the Old School of Economics. And uh, here, the main idea essentially is to estimate a, an instrumental variable regression without moving on the issues. So, let me start with uh, an introduction of the framework. Uh, we have a set to observe an ID symbol, y, x, z, and w where y is a response value. And we consider a part of the network. So we have y equal to x transpose beta plus phi z plus an uncertain error of root u. So here we do not assume that u is independent from x and z and we do not impose that the expectation of u given x and z is equal to z. Essentially, we allow for some, for some correlation between the uncertain error u and the explanatory variables. On the other hand, to uh, control this uh, uh, correlation, to this endogeneity, we introduce some instrumental variables W, such that the conditional expectation of U given W is equal to zero. So just the that they've already introduced, uh, presented uh, uh, quite a lot of obligations for that. Um, here, the not is assumed to be a finite dimensional parameter with S component, and finite is a non-parameter. Now, uh, just to introduce one more example, uh, an, an empirical example that often arises for uh, this equation is the estimation of an angle curve, which is essentially a divided for So here we have that y, in this empirical example, is the shape of expenditure of one primary good, x is a vector of controls, and z is the total expenditure of the household. So here the endogeneity arises because there are unobserved elements in you, which, are, which have a direct effect on the share of expenditure of the household and a direct effect on the total expenditure. And normally, the instrument that is introduced to control for this endogeneity is the total income of the household. So the interest here is in the estimation of beta <coughs> and phi, and from a mathematical point of view, this requires solving an inverse problem that is imposed, as we see soon. Now, uh, let me present uh, the traditional approach that is uh, uh, used uh, to estimate this model. So, to estimate this model, normally uh, what is done in the literature is to apply the conditional expectation, conditional on the view, to both sides of this equation and to use the uh, exogenite of the instruments. So, essentially, if we apply the conditional expectation of y over given the view to both sides, we obtain this equation where FW is the density of the instruments. <laughs> now, the estimation of beta and phi in this case proceeds in two steps. So, first of all, we have to estimate the condition expectation of Y given W, the joint density of the instruments, and the expectation of X given W, and the joint density of the instruments and the explanatory variables. So, essentially, uh, when we estimate all these objects, we also have to make a smoothing on the instrumental variables. And intuitively, we have to select a bucket for these instruments. Another uh, element which is typical of uh, the traditional approach is to use the Tikhonov regularization for the operator Tz. So, in particular, the operator Tz is invertible, it has an inverse, but the problem is that this inverse is not continuous. And so, to regularize the, this uh, imposedness, uh, people use normally Tikhonov regularization. Now, the issue when we use Tikhon of regularization is that it's quite intense from a computational point of view because it requires the inversion of a matrix of the same size as the sample size. And second, the Tikhon of regularization cannot exploit order of smoothness of phi larger than 2. So even if phi naught is a very smooth function, we cannot use this high order smoothness. Okay? So here they come our contribution. So, uh, First of all, the first contribution in this paper is that we propose an approach that does not require smoothing on the instrumental variables. And the main advantage of it is that we don't need to select a boundary for the instruments. So we need to select less smoothing parameters. The second contribution is that uh, we do not use the tipo of regularization, but in this semi parametric framework we introduce another regularization, which is the Landauer-Freeman scheme. So this is an iterative method 
that allows us to control the importance of the inverse problem and uh, does not require the inversion of a large matrix because it's a derivative. And on the top of that, it's able to exploit any level of smoothness of the non-parametric function finite. So we obtain the convergence rates of the non-parametric estimator and the asymptotic normality of the parametric part of the model. So a bit of a literature review. So this slide is extremely far from being exhaustive. So here I'm just uh, uh, citing the papers that are mostly connected uh, to ours. So there is a large literature on kernel estimation, so kernel smoothing estimation, not RKHS, uh, for the which is connected to our paper. But the and there is also a literature which, uh, which estimates the NPAD model by using a series estimation, series methods. But all of them they make a smoothing on a first step. So they, all of them, they make a smoothing on the instruments. Then there is also another literature which is related to ours, uh, to our paper. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Marine Carrasco, Jeffrey Florent de Le Paper, uh, Pascal and Valentin de Le Paper as well. Um, where uh, the goal is to estimate the semi-parametric model, but without smoothing, without overcoming the, double smooth, the smoothing approach. So, uh, in the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to proceed as follows. Uh, I will first of all uh, describe our approach and introduce the identification. Then uh, I will uh, introduce the landover Freeman regularization and the estimators. I will then highlight my results and the simulations. And uh, if time allows me, uh, I will also introduce some extensions. So, let's begin with the description of the approach. So the goal is to estimate beta and phi by using this conditional moment equation. Now, the first step to uh, avoid the smoothing on the instruments is to transform this conditional moment into a continuum of unconditional moments. And to this end, we use some results in the evidence. So, according to the results in the evidence, the conditional expectation of u given w is equal to zero if and only if the unconditional distribution of u multiplied by omega is equal to zero. Where this omega is an analytic non-polynomial function such that derivatives in zero are normal. So for example, uh, if we take omega equal to the complex exponential, it satisfies this kind of condition. Omega equal to cosinus plus sinus satisfies this condition, and also the real exponential satisfies this condition. Second, the tau, the capital tau, it has to be just a, a set that contains a neighborhood of the origin. Okay? So essentially here, this reformulation of the problem allows us, allows us to avoid the smoothing over instrumental values. So, from the continuum of moment, we essentially obtain this equation, which is an integral equation. So let me introduce uh, some uh, uh, spaces, just to be a little bit more rigorous. Uh, we introduce mu, that is a probability measure on the set two. So under some integrability conditions on y, we have that S, this, uh, this object here, is an element of L2 mu, which is the space of square integrable functions with respect to mu. Then under some integrability conditions on X, we also have that Ax maps Rs to L2 mu, where S is the dimension of the beta. Then finally, the Az is an operator that maps L2 Rp to L2 mu, where P is the dimension of the Z. In particular, to handle this operator Az, to be able to estimate this infinite dimensional operator, we will project, first of all, the omega on the z. So, our az is going to be just an integral operator that is characterized by this kernel here. So, in particular, estimating now, from an intuitive point of view, estimating the s just requires estimating this average, this uh, population average. So, we're going to estimate this by the empirical mean. We're going to estimate ax also by using an empirical mean. On the other hand, to estimate Az, we'll just have to estimate this kernel here in orange. And to estimate this kernel, we just have to select a bandit on the Z, not a bandit on the instruments. So this is the step that allows us to avoid the uh, uh, smoothing over the instrumental values. 
Of course, since AZ is a compact operator, because it's a kind of operator, we're going to have an if poses of the inverse problem that we have to control. And we do it by a lambda Gerfima regularization, but that's something that I'm going to do. So, uh, just a few words on identification. So, uh, the equation that we obtain from the model is uh, just equation 1, and the our integral equation is uh, equation 2, where each element is defined as follows here. So, we obtain that beta naught and phi naught, they are identified from equation 1, if and only if they are identified from equation 2 and this holds if and only if two conditions are satisfied so first of all we must have that AX and AZ they are injective so one to one and second we must have that the intersection between the range of AX and the range of AZ is has to contain only the identical zero function so we will actually assume these two conditions throughout uh, this uh, presentation here so let me introduce now the Landauber film regularization. Uh, so we have uh, an integral equation essentially. And we have an inverse problem because uh, AZ is a compact operator. In particular, the AZ is injective in the sense that the inverse of the AZ exists, it's well defined. But the problem is that it's not continuous. So for example, even if we had a consistent estimator of S, AX and beta, we could, we, could, we could not estimate phi by this uh, composition here because uh, the convergence uh, of this uh, argument does not imply the convergence of all these objects mm -hmm. because of the lack of continuity so the continuous mapping theorem does not apply in this case so the idea is to, as usual, to replace the, this inverse by a regularization scheme which is essentially an operator that is sufficiently close to the inverse of AZ and it's at the same time continuous. So, what is usually done in the literature is to uh, uh, use a ticon of regularization, but here we want to avoid the ticon regularization because it's quite intense from a computational point of view. And so we use the Lambert schema regularization. So, this is an iterative schema, and so, for example, if we want to compute the, this composition here with the Lambert schema regularization, we just have to do a finite number of iterations. So we start with this uh, initial value, where the star is the dual of this operator, and then we repeat a finite number of iterations according to this operator here. And then we stop at a finite n. So contrary to the article of scheme, the landover theorem regularization uh, does not require the inversion of a large matrix of the same size as the sample size. And moreover, it's able to exploit smoothness order higher than 2 for the final. So, if the final has a smoothness order higher than 2, the Landauer Freeman regularization is going to take advantage of it. So, uh, let's switch to the estimation. Uh, we'll estimate the model in two steps. So, first of all, we will estimate the beta naught, the parametric part of the model, and then, given the beta naught, and given an estimate of S, we will estimate phi naught by importing the AZ by using the random schema scheme. <coughs> so, to estimate the beta naught, first of all, we will isolate this uh, uh, finite dimensional component. So, let's define PZ as the projection operator onto the range of AZ. <coughs> then, by applying the, this residual operator, we partial out the non parametric part of the model, and then we can isolate the beta naught in this, in this way here. So, an estimator of beta naught is going to be just uh, uh, obtained by replacing uh, these unknown quantities by their estimates. So, it's going to take the, this, following, uh, this following form, where the S hat is just the empirical mean of Y multiplied by omega. AX hat is just the empirical mean of X multiplied by omega. And here we estimate this projection operator by applying A hat Z to the Langweber Freeman regularization scheme. So the A hat Z in particular is estimated by doing a kernel estimation, by applying a kernel estimation of these two objects. So here we do a kernel estimation of the density of the Z, and here we do a kernel estimation of this object here. And as we can see here again, uh, we just have to select a single bundle for Z, not a bundle for the W as well. 
Once we have obtained the beta, the beta hat, we just have to uh, uh, isolate this component here on the left hand side and then we obtain an estimate of the phi hat by applying the Landau Griffin scheme to this difference. So here we come with the main results. So let's assume uh, that AX and AZ they are injective, so they are one to one, and the intersection between the ranges is equal to zero, to the identical zero function. So under some regularity conditions, we obtain uh, uh, the asymptotic root and asymptotic normality of the parametric part of the model, and we obtain the convergence rate of the L2 norm of the non-parametric part. Now here, this convergence rate of the non-parametric part depends on the number of other equivalent that we do, or and on the h, which is the bandwidth used to estimate on z. But of course, we don't have a bandwidth for the instruments. Now, there is uh, actually uh, a very nice interpretation of uh, uh, this uh, of this estimator, which is uh, connected also with the more classical estimator that smooths over the instrumental variables. Uh, it's actually a result that is connected to one of the papers of Valentin uh, because uh, the, paper that, the papers that move over the instrumental variables they essentially they have to uh, send to zero the bandwidth on the instruments otherwise we can think that the estimation method is not consistent well, what we actually find here is that uh, those methods they are going to be consistent even if one doesn't send to zero the bandwidth over the instruments and this is a byproduct of our proof in particular, let's consider the uh, classical approach that smooths over the instruments. So one has this type of uh, integral equation, as we saw before. This type of approach requires selecting, requires estimating the conditional expectation of y given w, the joint, the density of the instruments, the conditional expectation of x given w, and the joint density of w and z. So once we have estimated this, we can solve this equation, the empirical counterpart on this, and obtain the estimates of beta and phi naught in the classical traditional approach. So now, uh, of course, uh, since we, in the traditional approach one has to, has to select a bandwidth from the instruments, this bandwidth has to go to zero. Otherwise, here we will have a non-parametric bias that does not converge to zero, obviously. Now, uh, in our case, actually, in our, our estimator actually coincides with this specific, uh, with the estimator of the traditional approach, if two conditions are satisfied. In particular, if we use uh, a weighting function, which is the complex exponential, and if we have this equality, we have a numerical identity between our estimator and the estimator of the traditional approach. Specifically, this identity tells us that uh, the convolution between the kernel uh, for smoothing on the instruments and the Fourier transform of zero, this equality has to be satisfied. Well, HW is the bounded that smooths over the instrumental variable. Of course, in our case, the mu is a fixed measure. It doesn't change with n. So, this F mu, which is the Fourier transform, Fourier transform of mu, uh, is not going to change with the sample size. But if this doesn't change with the sample size, also the left hand side is not going to change with the sample size. And so the bandwidth on the instruments it has to be fixed. So this equality in particular is going to be satisfied, for example, when the KW is selected as the Gaussian kernel of order 2 and mu is selected as the Gaussian density, for instance. But on the other hand, in the previous slide we have shown that our estimator is indeed consistent under some regularity conditions. So, implicitly, what we have shown is that in the classical approach, in the traditional approach, even if one keeps the bounded fixed over the instrumental variables, the estimators of phi naught and beta naught will remain consistent despite the fact that these operators are not consistent. And these are the operators that define the initial integral equations in the traditional approach which is actually a result connected with uh, one of the papers of Valentin. Okay, so now let's go to the uh, simulations and find who we find, so it's fine. So the simulations, we have taken a data generating process from uh, one of the papers of uh, Jean-Pierre, where we have uh, a part model, 
and we have uh, three different instruments. So here we have that uh, W1, W2, and WT are, are the three instruments, and they are generated according to a standard normal. The U is also a standard normal, and because the uh, Z, uh, the Z okay, is, has to be uh, the instrument has to be relevant, and because the eta is going to be uh, correlated with the uh, U, we're going to have the endogeneity of the Z and the X. Okay? So for the implementation, we use a Gaussian kernel of order 2. We use mu as a squared sinc function, uh, a squared sinc density, and omega as a complex exponential. So this is a quite convenient choice because then we're going to have the, the f the mu, the characteristic function of mu, is just the triangular density. So it's quite fast from a computational point of view. Then uh, hz is chosen to be either the uh, cost value the bandwidth or the bandwidth obtained by the silver, silver marginal of time. On the other hand, the M, the number of Landauer Freeman iterations, is selected by a cross-validation. So it's, a, it's an empirical selection in this case. Now, let's switch to the uh, uh, consistency results for the beta length. So the true value of beta is equal to 1, and in this table we have here the mean, the Monte Carlo, the mean between the Monte Carlo deviation, so the uh, expected value of beta hat, and the standard deviation of uh, beta hat. So here MCB again is the, the Landauer Freeman regularization selected by cross validation, and then to check the uh, stability of our results with respect to the uh, regularization parameter, we multiply this regularization parameter by 10. So here uh, we have two central styles in this multi-tab replication, and we have 200 and 400. And so we, we see that, uh, as we can expect, as we increase the sample size, the uh, expected value of beta hat converges to the to 1, which is the true value, and the standard deviation of beta hat decreases, so we have a decrease of the mean square vector. And something which is uh, very attractive here is that uh, this kind of results, they remain uh, stable, when uh, we perturb uh, for a, a big uh, uh, constant the number of Landauer Freeman iterations. So that's actually another uh, positive feature of uh, our Landauer Freeman iteration method. So we have obtained actually the asymptotic normality of beta hat, and so we also wanted to check how well is the uh, uh, how well the valve test works in this case. So to to compute the valve test actually. Uh, well, in the wild test, actually, yeah, we want to uh, check uh, this uh, uh, null hypothesis here. Uh, but the asymptotic variance of beta hat, uh, it has a kind of complicated expression. So what we have done, uh, we have approximated it by bootstrap. Okay? Formally, we haven't proved the validity of the bootstrap, but we expect that it's going to work theoretically because we have the asymptotic normality in this case, and it's not like a kind of pathological case. So here we have uh, uh, that we check, again, the stability of the coverage for uh, MCV with the M selected by cross-validation and uh, MCV multiplied by 10. So here there are the empirical rejections of the test and in bold there are the nominal sizes of the valve test. And so we can see that the coverage is uh, uh, the error in the rejection probability, it decreases as long as we increase the sample size and we have a kind of acceptable coverage here. Now, something else that I want to highlight is that uh, uh, having n equal to 200 or n equal to 400 is kind of uh, uh, it's small for the non-parametric instrumental variable estimation because uh, it's not only a non-parametric problem, but we also have uh, that the inverse problem is imposed. Okay. Finally, we have uh, uh, some, uh, also some uh, simulations for find out. Here, uh, in, the, in black, we have the non-parametric function phi naught, and in blue, there is the estimator of phi naught for a single sample. Then we also have the Monte Carlo confidence interval, but uh, that's going to be in the paper. So here, for, we can see that as the sample size increases, we are getting, we are getting uh, uh, a better estimate of this. And here again, the uh, M is selected by cross validation, the number of lantography monitoration. Okay, so uh, here I come to the conclusions, uh, I was quite fast. 
So we have uh, focused on a semi-parametric part of the model with endogenous regressors, which is identified by instrumental variables. And uh, our approach, the main contribution is that, it, first of all, it does not move over the instrumental variables. The second contribution is that we have used a Landauer firma regularization in a semi-parametric framework. So we have obtained the asymptotic normality of the beta hat and the convergence rates of the non-parametric part of the model. And uh, again, something that uh, we like from a theoretical point of view is that uh, our method shows that also the traditional approach that smooths over the instrument but keeps the bandwidth fixed on the instrument, it remains consistent even by keeping the bandwidth fixed, which is kind of surprising result. But it's a nice result. So here we are focused on a part of the model uh, where, uh, uh, but at the same time, implicitly our proofs they also hold for a semi-parametric transformation model with endogenous regressors. So actually, yeah, the proofs are exa exactly the same. Uh, so there are some extensions that uh, we're working on with uh, JAT and with Pascal as well. Uh, and actually, here this extension is going to be on an additively separable model, which is estimated by smoothing splines. Uh, and uh, we use the same kind of uh, machinery where uh, we don't make a smoothing on the instrumental variables, but first of all, we transform uh, the conditional moment restriction into a continuum of unconditional moments, and then we run the semi parametric smoothing spline method. And yeah, the theory is going to be based on reproducing calibre spaces, uh, but uh, yeah, we have some proofs for that. And actually, we have simulations, and this method works quite well. Work quite, it worked quite well actually because here we are introducing a sobol effect. So we are really like imposing the smoothness also in the, uh, uh, in the uh, estimation method. So it's something that uh, is not surprising. And yeah, and that's all. So thank you very much. There is time for a few questions. and a very attractive uh, example because uh, very interesting you mentioned that uh, this uh, can apply to the injury expenditure function yeah. and uh, have you done it? Well, uh, it has been done a lot in the, uh, in the literature uh, so it's the typical example so you read the non-parametric IV paper uh, you find this is a typical example we haven't done it uh, because uh, the issue is that the paper is crying quite a lot and we want to keep a uh, uh, finite number of pages, but yeah, we're going to do it in a supplement. Yeah, because it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, very I mean, it's, uh, it's a classical, uh, uh, it's a classical application, so yes. it's not going to be that new for this literature. Right. But, but for example, another application would be like uh, in demand estimation, maybe not the same data set that John has shown, uh, because in that case we don't have ranking files. So stupid to apply that, but, uh, uh, but we could uh, use uh, demand estimation for cars, there are, there are available data sets and so on. we could do it on this, it's always a demand estimation. Thank you. Uh, some other questions please? Just a minor point, yeah. BNS factorization requires that you integrate over the entire area. Yes. How come you only require a small integral? So, um, actually, the characterization requires that we can select a, 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 a compact set that encompasses the origin. But it doesn't require us to, to uh, integrate over the entire, the entire, to the entire set. Uh, it doesn't. Sorry? It doesn't or it does? No, it, it doesn't require to integrate over the entire line. Well, the, the reason is that, uh, imagine that the W is unbounded. Okay? So, this... Uh, uh, this conditional equation is equivalent to another, the same conditional equation where we transform the, the W by a bounded transformation. For example, you apply the arctangent, these kinds of things. And that's going to be bounded, let's say. And so we don't need to integrate over the real line. But even if you don't have this kind of, yeah, that's, uh, that's the main thing. So, but actually, we have done simulations with both cases uh, and it doesn't change much. Uh, the domain that we do, we consider always, you know, our theory, it holds for everything, so for the bounded and unbounded case, so it's, uh, it's uh, robust to that. We have, so we have also considered this kind of logistic transformation or tangent and so on in simulation, it doesn't change much. So it's, uh, we obtain quite stable results, so we're satisfied with that. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, 
Hello everyone, <coughs> thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm very happy to, to present you this work. Uh, so this is uh, about fitness and about the introduction of a, a new statistic called the lack of fitness. This is a joint work with uh, Valentin Pativea. And so uh, actually it was um, at the beginning of this uh, research project, we, uh, our goal was uh, to, to present to, to that conference. So it's the first time uh, the, 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 this work is presented. And I would like to, to underline that it's still ongoing work, so any remark or uh, critic, even criticism are more than uh, welcome. Okay. Um, so here is the, the outline uh, of the talk. So first, I'm going to, to introduce uh, the, the mathematical background, which is related with goodness of fit for densities. Then I'm going to switch to the, the, the presentation of the fitness coefficient, which is uh, in fact something that has been uh, introduced uh, in the 80s by Olkin and Spiegelman, and our aim is to revisit this, uh, this idea of the fitness coefficient in order to build uh, statistics allowing us to do goodness of fit. And then I will present our main uh, theoretical result, which is related to the, the weak convergence of that uh, statistic. And finally, a brief uh, numerical experiment uh, uh, will be present. Okay, so um, the background is really simple. So I have uh, the, so the true density is seen uh, uh, with the help of, uh, of a random sample of uh, ID random variable. X1 up to Xn, and so we assume it, it's um, distributed according to uh, a density f dot, which is unknown. I have a parametric model, which is denoted by uh, uh, capital P, <coughs> and I, um, my aim is to estimate that density. But before that, I would like to know if uh, my model is correct. Uh, that uh, is equivalent to say that if the true density belongs to the model. So this will be my, uh, my uh, new hypothesis that uh, h dot, uh, so h dot is given by the fact that, calculated by the fact that uh, the true density is in my model. Why is that? So this question is uh, central to, to statistics because it allows to, 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 to say whether or not uh, the approach is reliable if parametric inference is valid and um, <coughs> looking at some scores that you can get uh, in doing good, goodness of fit you can ultimately uh, compare some models. So this approach has been uh, uh, well studied in the past and I would like to, to underline one of the, the main ideas in this literature. Um, so it's based on discrepancy. Uh, say you have a discrepancy between densities, so this is denoted by D, and it represents how much different uh, could be two densities. The main uh, stream, the main idea in the literature is to compute um, uh, the discrepancy between the non-parametric approach and the parametric ones. Looking at that, um, uh, it's a simple idea. It's based on, the, uh, on this fact, uh, so this is the, the picture. So in the first case, so under the new, your, the true density, which is here in pink, lie inside the model and making the parametric approach really good. Okay? Otherwise, under the alternative, the parametric approach uh, becomes really poor, really bad estimate. And so, um, regardless, of the, or regardless of the null or the alternative, the, the non-parametric approach behaves more or less the same. So looking at the distance, this discrepancy, uh, is a good idea to, 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 to assert whether or not the null or the alternative is realized. Okay, so this is pretty basic and uh, um, here are only a few uh, examples, a few work because the, the literature is uh, too, too vast to be, to be summarized here. So um, first you can, um, I can, I can tell about some papers that are looking at the L2 distance, so the, the discrepancy that is uh, considered is the L2 distance. You also have uh, some papers considering the cool back library divergence. This is uh, following work by uh, Nima about the uh, smooth test. And also L1 distance of Wasserstein. And in the end, I would like to, to, well, to bring to your attention some other approaches that are related to characteristic functions or a continuum uh, set of moment equations or as it was uh, uh, um, uh, so it was uh, in the talk by Arthur this morning uh, it's like a maximum mean discrepancy 
where a, a set of, uh, of moment equations could be used to characterize the distribution. So um, this last part is a bit different from the, 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 the one that are working at the density level. Working at the density level has uh, 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 some kind of a problem, it's because you, you pay the price. The price you pay is the, the poor rate of convergence of the non-parametric estimate. If you look at the moment equation, then even non-parametric estimate will have a parametric rate of convergence. So, in the last point, they, they argue that their approach will have a, a good, uh, well, better power property than the one based on the density. To sum up, um, important questions that are in this literature, first of all, is um, uh, computational questions. Uh, is uh, my statistic easy, easy to compute? Do I need Monte Carlo procedure? Related to that question is the, the the fact, uh, well, the, the shape of the limiting distribution, is it pivotal? If it's not, some bootstrap procedure could be required, and so computational re, re, uh, additional computational resources would be needed. Um, and at last, uh, um, the question of the power, which is uh, uh, how much my uh, data could be different from the null, while I still detect uh, the, the, the alternative. Um, here, uh, here is uh, the, the positioning of the paper. So the approach we are uh, about to, to, to propose is totally new, totally different from uh, the discrepancy-based approach that I underlined before. Uh, it's simple to compute. You will see that the, the, the limiting distribution is pivotal. And uh, finally, and this is still at the state of conjecture because we, we haven't proved that result, but we think that we believe that the Pitman alternative can be detected at a parametric rate, which is uh, very nice because uh, you will see that we are working with a density level. Okay, so here is the, the introduction of the fitness coefficient. The fitness coefficient uh, is, uh, follows from a competition between two estimates, a competition between the parametric and the non-parametric. In that way, it's different from the discrepancy approach in which people are looking at the closeness between both. Here, I'm looking, putting them into a competition. So let's say what's good and what's bad in, in, in this. First of all, let's say what's good and what's bad in the, the, two, the two propositions. So the, the kernel density estimate has the, the following form. If you take this, the expectation of that guy, you recover the convolution. And so uh, comes the, the, the bias variance decomposition of the kernel density estimate. It, it's important to, to be aware of the two rates. Because in our approach, we are going to select the bandwidth parameter H so that the bias is going to be negligible. This will be an important matter, an important point in order to get a pivotal statistic. I will say a little bit more about that uh, in the next. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, okay, another point is that uh, the leave one out, it's a, a kind of a trick that allows you to, to evaluate your density estimate at a sample point. The trick is to remove uh, that estimate from the from the from the that that, the, the, that uh, sample point from the estimate, so that you get rid of some bias. This idea has been successful in the non-parametric literature to achieve bandwidth selection, but also in the, the semi-parametric M estimation literature. The maximum likelihood estimate, as I said before, has a very nice behavior when uh, the model is correct and a poor behavior when the model is uh, uh, misspecified. Okay, so how can I put them into a kind of a competition? The idea is the idea of the mixture. I consider a um, um, mixture between the two density, so the mixture is uh, given by the, the, the parameter alpha, and I'm going to choose this parameter alpha through uh, using the likelihood. So the result that comes naturally, and which is provided already in the paper, is the consistency of the parameter alpha. Since, as, the, as it goes with the intuition I, I provided before, in the null, under the null, the parametric is very close to the truth, so alpha naturally is going to be close to 1. Meaning that in your competition, you're going to choose the parametric approach. Otherwise, 
when you are under the alternative, the parametric is the, the bad estimate, and the alpha that is going to be chosen is then close to zero. So you have this uh, dichotomic behavior of alpha uh, regarding the uh, well according to the to the to the nil to the nil or the alternative. So <clears throat> one thing is that as soon as you have obtained your parametric estimate and your non-parametric kernel estimate, then it's really easy to compute. It's just a, a concat function uh, defined over the segment 0, 1. And um, so far, this uh, approach has been used to, to prevent from a model misspecification effect. That is, instead of using the parametric or the non-parametric approach, you use that mixture that you have just computed through using the lighting. Doing so, you are always as good as the better of the two guys, the parametric or the non-parametric. Today, we want to, to, to go further and we want to use this uh, dichotomic behavior in order to test if the model is correct or not. So this means that uh, we are first looking at the, the null hypothesis and we are looking at the rate of convergence of alpha to, uh, to 1. So this is the, our first uh, job here. And let me uh, start with a problem that is uh, directly encountered when you, when you try to do so. When you try to do so, you, you are considering some uh, leave one out estimate that appears in your likelihood. Uh, and uh, you have also the true density. If you develop that linearly, you see that you are going to be uh, uh, badly affected by, by uh, small uh, values of uh, your density. And so in low, low density region, Will, will imply uh, a bad behavior of uh, those kind of statistics. So our first uh, uh, step is to remove some of the data points. So we introduce this uh, set S, which is a region of uh, your date of your covariate. Um, <coughs> this uh, <coughs> indicator function is going to select uh, uh, your um, your data so that. Uh, you get rid of the uh, um, low density region problem. So we are working under the assumption that uh, f dot is lower bounded on s, and as soon as you have this uh, uh, new element s that shows up uh, in your likelihood, then you, you you've lost something. You you've lost the, the, the divergence property of the of the, 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 the your this estimate. So you no longer estimate a divergence, and so you need to 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 come with a, an additional term, a correction term, in order to recover the, the what is called the extended pullback divergence divergence that works with uh, uh, functions that are not proper density. So you, you you no longer have the property to integrate to one, but you can still compute that in order to 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 recover a divergence between functions. So that's why. We have this uh, uh, term in red. Okay. And so we have uh, uh, proposed, we propose this uh, modification. And also, okay, what is funny, what is um, interesting is that in the proof, those two terms, the, the two terms that I introduced here, which were natural in order to, to obtain a divergence uh, uh, metric, uh, in fact are really useful. Because they are, they are used, they, 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 are, they, they come as a centering term of uh, the empirical process we get in the proof. <coughs> okay, so now I have introduced the, the lack of fitness. The lack of fitness is sorry, the lack of fitness is one minus alpha half. And now uh, comes our main result. So the, the main result is as follows. Uh, we have uh, three different assumptions. The first one, as I said is that on S, uh, my, densities are, my density is lower than D. Then I took from the empirical process literature some, a natural way to, to, to model my kernel. So my kernel uh, should be a function of the norm. And uh, then uh, with uh, the bounded variation uh, assumption, I uh, can, sh uh, well, the, it's a fact that uh, the, the, the class generated by, by my uh, kernels are uh, of uh, VC type. This is useful in our proof. And here is uh, um, an important point. So the, the, the first two conditions about the bandwidth 
uh, are uh, uh, usual because they are needed for consistency of uh, the kernel density estimate. And what is uh, more uh, awkward is the, this assumption. This assumption says, implies that the, 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 the bias part in the, the kernel density uh, error uh, will vanish as some decay. And what is uh, um, uh, what carry the, the error is only the variance part. Okay, this is really important because if not, then my limiting distribution would not be as uh, simple as it is right here. Okay, so what is uh, also needed is uh, that uh, that assumption on the, my uh, parametric model, and you see that uh, this assumption clearly implies that we are working under the new hypothesis. And so here comes our main result. You can see that this is a very nice uh, distribution. So it's a um, truncated Gaussian because uh, it's um, an optimization problem on uh, contract interval. And um, you see there is VK, which depends only on the kernel. So it's something that you choose. So you have no, no you don't, you, not any pain to, 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 to compute that. And also what, uh, what uh, appears is uh, the, the, the volume of S. So it's interesting because it means that if uh, S is getting larger and larger, then it's going to change your rate of convergence. Here, in our setup, S is fixed. And this is something you choose, so you can still compute that volume. So everything here uh, is known. Everything is uh, computable. So it means that we obtain a pivotal statistic for our test. Um, I would, uh, so, a few uh, words about the, the, the proof of that. Uh, first of all, I would like to give an heuristic, because uh, the heuristic is, uh, is meaningful also to understand, to understand our conjecture about the power of the test. In fact, since I've, I've um, considered the competition between parametric and non-parametric, what uh, alpha is doing when you, when you select it, alpha is uh, doing a, a, a compromise, uh, is making a com compromise between the error made by the parametric and the error made by the non-parametric. Following this, uh, this heuristic, you can develop this error into two terms, the parametric and the non-parametric error. Then you plug the two uh, different rate of convergence according to our assumptions. And you see that the only way to recover a small rate of uh, the, the, the only way to recover a parametric rate is to flip the value of one minus alpha to that rate, which is exactly the rate we obtain here. Okay, so this is an explanation of this uh, uh, bandwidth-driven uh, rate. This is the, the only rate that could uh, uh, do the trade-off between the two terms, the two error. Okay, so the, another uh, thing which is uh, uh, meaningful for the proof is that it's not a standard uh, uh, M estimation problem. If you look at the limiting uh, quantity of my objective function, I, I don't find something that depends on the parameter I'm looking for. I find something that is constant. So if I wish to, to use a, a M estimation uh, classical theory, I'm, uh, I cannot do that because the limiting distribution does not depend on alpha, so I cannot uh, consider the R, R max of this uh, quantity. What is uh, uh, interesting is that uh, uh, the, the good uh, theorem to use is one uh, result due to Yurt and Polar, which has been used in other, uh, uh, other fields, such as uh, the, the asymptot obtaining the asymptotic distribution of the lasso, or working with the quantile uh, regression estimate, here it's a very different problem, but still it's useful. So it says that as soon as you can, uh, you have a, a, a convex function, as soon as you can develop your convex function according to quadratic ones, then the behavior of the two respective admin are more or less the same. We cannot use, use that directly to our problem. We need to, to do kind of a variable change and to express, rather than alpha, to express the, the the, the parameter through G, which is a renormalized version of alpha, so this is really easy to do, and then you apply that result to this, uh, uh, to this quantity. So what is important is to develop this quantity into two terms, a linear terms, which 
going to be this uh, Zn, and a quadratic term which is going to be this uh, v, v value. The two terms, what is uh, nice, is that it only depends on the non-parametric part of the problem. The, 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 the parametric part does not appear. It, it is, uh, in fact, uh, negligible in the development. And this is uh, very important to get the pivotal statistics in here. And so, um, the linear part of the non-parametric is uh, as that uh, the following shape. This is the quadratic part. This one will converge to a, a, norm, a Gaussian random variable, so it's a, a, an important step in our proof. And this one is going to converge in probability to some constant. And in that way, we recover the quantities that are involved in our weak uh, convergence property. What is helpful, of course, is the new statistic theory, so high decomposition, and also uh, uh, central limit theorem from a paper uh, by Peter Hoff. Okay, so now I would like to finish with a very brief numerical illustration, just to, to, to validate uh, the, the approach and to, to um, open uh, this, this question, uh, the, the question we have about the power of, the, of, uh, of our test. So we consider two uh, different um, um, two different uh, setups. The, the, the first one is uh, under the null uh, hypothesis. So it's pretty basic. You have a, a Gaussian distribution for X. You choose uh, S, so the, the set that, uh, that is used to remove some of the data is chosen as follows in order to remove only 5% of the data. Uh, we have a Gaussian model with a parameter where the, the parameter is the mean. And so, and we use a, a uniform kernel uh, plus uh, a bandwidth uh, of that uh, order so that all my uh, previous assumptions are satisfied. <coughs> the two quantities uh, are really easy to compute here because you can, uh, you can, have, uh, you can do some algebra and, and obtain some, uh, some value for it. Um, also, um, my optimization problem is over Zero, the segment 0, 1, I extend a little bit this segment in order to have a nice uh, figure without truncated, norm, without truncated Gaussian but full uh, Gaussian distribution. So this is just for clarity that I am doing so. So first of all, under the, the null uh, hypothesis, what we obtain uh, is such kind of a graph in order to validate uh, our, uh, esteem, our way to, to, to calibrate the test. So the, the, the variance that we find in theory appears to be the good one according to, the, to that figure where we see that uh, the, the blue curves are an uh, approximation of the, 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 the Gaussian distribution. I would like to show you, uh, um, to finish with, I would like to, to, to describe what is a Pitman alternative. So the Pitman alternative is something which is local. Uh, I, have, I can see it uh, through the prism of the contamination. Um, I have my uh, uh, Xi that is distributing according to a mixture. The first part is uh, like the the, like the, 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 good, the is like is in the model, so I am near my model. And the second part is uh, uniform distribution. Since p, the parameter of the mixture, is going to be small, I am uh, very close from my model, and the order I took for P is the parametric rate in order to validate if I can detect uh, uh, in such a case. So I am a bit away from my model, a parametric uh, rate away from my model, and I would like to know if my test is uh, sufficiently powerful in order to detect that, that kind of uh, hypothesis. And um, what we are going to do is to fix this uh, rate 1 over square root n, but we are going to play on that constant. What we hope is that taking c, uh, the constant c, uh, larger will allow us to, to detect this, uh, this uh, hypothesis. And this is what happened exactly. As you see, when the value of c uh, are getting larger, uh, our test statistic is going to, to diverge. So it implies, uh, well, it, um, it supports uh, our conjecture that uh, uh, the, the parameter, the, well, the, our test can detect Pitman alternative at parametric rate, which was not the case for the other uh, approaches that consider discrepancy between densities. 
there is the, the literature. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh,
would be the one you should choose. So here you have a, a constant term under your, your assumption. So it's the one that make uh, equal to, to that term. So it would be precisely 1 divided by uh, square root n times hn at the power t. I guess. But it's a conjecture. Uh, 
to try to test, for example, that uh, we have independence between these uh, two vectors, X and I. Uh, well, there are many approximations uh, in the rules of it using the estimation of the empirical characteristics, um, uh, but uh, the key in the distance covariance is to use a special uh, distance between the difference of the uh, characteristic function of the vector TS and the product of the marginal characteristics. So, if we use this kind of L2 weight distance, eh, introduced in a very seminal paper in 2007, Sir Kelly uh, in Elements of Statistics, and also provided in the context of energy of data more recently in the Animal Radio Statistics, using this uh, uh, distance, we have that the independence is due if and only if this theoretical distance is equal to zero. Okay? Well, uh, the idea of called uh, covariance distance is that if we make the empirical estimation of, of the weighted distance uh, using uh, the distance uh, between the x data and the y data, so the empirical estimation is exactly the, the covariance between the receptor distance. Okay? Well, other uh, possibility uh, introduced some uh, years later is uh, not try to test the dependence between x and y, but also the dependence of x over y throughout the regression. Uh, in that case, uh, the L2 uh, weighted distance has to be modified. Uh, we use the product of the mean of y by the characteristic function of x. And here we have more or less the Fourier transformation of the conditional mean expression. That can be written uh, as here indicated. Well, again, we have that uh, the expectation of y conditional to x is equal to expectation of y if and only if this coefficient called martingale difference divergence is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, again, uh, as in the, uh, in the previous work of Sekai and others, uh, if we use the uh, empirical estimation of these elements, we have some kind of covariance uh, between the distance of x and y, and many times this uh, distance can be also corrected to reveal the bias. Mm -hmm. This was introduced in 2014 in the JASA paper, uh, Marking a Difference Correlation and It Use in High Dimensional Variable Screening. Third possibility is try to see the independence between x and i conditional to the formation of a zeta vector. In that case, uh, we have the conditional distance covariance. The distance here defined is the same as the second introduced, but using conditional distributions. Here, the problem is a little more complicated because uh, we have to estimate in our empirical estimation a uh, conditional uh, uh, aspects, and then we have to use the bandwidth and we have to use the neighborhood of the distance that we are using for the estimation. In fact, the empirical estimate, some kind of empirical estimate of this quantity is a U statistic using weights based in the uh, carrier distance to the neighborhood of the, the, the data information. Well, in summary, uh, we have uh, three kinds of uh, mission uh, to be used in the testing. Uh, the distance covariance, the martingale difference uh, divergence, and the conditional distance covariance. Of course, uh, here we try to test something more strong that uh, we are testing using the martingale. And in the third, in the third uh, element, we try to test independence under the conditional distance. Uh, in parallel uh, to this. Uh, uh, tools, uh, we could discover uh, many other papers uh, more uh, on the people of machine learning. This is using some uh, equivalent uh, formulation uh, throughout the uh, uh, reduced Hilbert, uh, uh, Hilbert space, kernel Hilbert space, and uh, under my knowledge, 
uh, we have one very interesting paper in 2015, when the of is still present, uh, where it's possible to see the distance between these two approximations. There are some work, I don't know if it's published or not in this moment, that try to see what happened between the equivalence with the, these two approximations under the condition of uh, independence, and uh, more difficult is the case is of the martingale difference dimensions. Well, uh, so with these three ideas, and using our experience in, in goodness of it, previous works, we try to see what is uh, the possibility of this approximation in some complex models. There are many possibilities. I only illustrate here two. Okay? Uh, the first one is related, for example, the use uh, of this kind of methodology in testing the diffusion process. Diffusion process for us are very interesting. We have experience with people of the band trying to modelize uh, the interest rate. Okay? So, uh, suppose that we have a stochastic differential equation and we try to make, for example, the goodness of it about uh, some elements of this differential equation, for example, of the volatility, which is crucial in the modification, especially in this uh, coming moment that we have <laughs> with the finals uh, in the next months. So, the, uh, one possibility is work directly in the process, and other possibility is work with some discrete approximation. Uh, using a discrete approximation of this differential equation, as here indicated, and for simplicity, taking the, the possibility that the distance in the points of the discrete approximation are equal to space, and call this distance the delta, and then uh, we can rewrite the, the discrete approximation <coughs> using this formulation of a tie of regression. Okay? So, uh, that means that I, I have uh, this YTI that is exactly the increment with respect to the delta distribution approximation. And this is the drift, this is uh, the volatility. And uh, using the ideas of uh, the, the, the first approximation, conditional correlation distance, uh, excuse me, correlation distance, we, we can uh, use the error. And if the error is uh, have a good specification, then this error is independent of the x. Okay? So uh, we can uh, more or less use the previous approximation to test independence between the error and the, the evolution of the active inference. So uh, we have a, a good specification that is equivalent of independence in the context I comment, if and only if the error and the xt are independent. Well, uh, if we use, uh, for example, a root n estimator of the parameter in the specification of the model, we can apply, the, for example, the empirical estimation of, here indicated, the covariance empirical correlation distance, and, and it is possible, I will not go inside of the technical details, it's possible to see does the end uh, converge to L2 norm of a Gaussian process. Okay? This is, uh, there are already very recent papers, uh, I did not comment in my presentation, in the media of Mikos and other people, where they study the independence in time series and similar methodology can be applied here. Well, uh, uh, with some illustration of this approximation, uh, we thought, well, uh, which kind of text we have uh, in, in the previous author? Well, uh, there are many different approximations. For example, uh, the approximation using the, the tools of empirical regression process, it's a paper we published some years ago, using martingale transformation, using uh, the, this kind of smoothing uh, test, in particular in this paper, if I am not wrong, I think they are using some kind of third test hmm, for the dependent data. Okay, and uh, here is one comparison for testing, for example, this kind of null hypothesis 
for the size simulation five different scenarios uh, uh, for the power simulation five scenarios with drift with this same drift function okay? and the comparison with the empirical transition process the asymptotic distribution marking a distribution observation and also the called non-parametric test I am called non-parametric test the test that is using smooth well, uh, things are well. Uh, I, I don't see any uh, competitor that is the winner. Uh, but I think all the procedures are working well in this context for the empirical size, the calibration. We use the, the calibration for empirical process using the booster approximation for the calibration, for the uh, synthetic marking gate transformation, the marking gate transformation, the calibration. The non parametric we well select bandwidth and the distance covariance. So things are fine, but they are well, uh, well calibrated. In the distance covariance, we use the, the Boostra uh, parametric approximation under the loop. Well, we respect with the power also uh, nice things because uh, our example is uh, one dimensional because our active is XD is one dimensional scalar value. The nice things uh, where we could see the, the good behavior of the, the conditional, the, the correlation distance approximation is when we are increasing the dimension. And this, I think, is an interesting exercise because we use the CAR CRP model that is at one nice stage of the post equilibrium process. And we can test the null hypothesis of our Orstein cooling process, but supposing that we have p, p equal 1 or more uh, general p dimensions in the evolution. Okay? So, uh, to, to see the power in the alternative, uh, we use a threshold. Okay? The threshold destroy here the, the null hypothesis of the process. And uh, the empirical level. Under the null is working well also for all approximations. But of course you can see as the the test well designed for especially for small dimensions in the covariance are losing power with the covariance distance is not losing the power in the in the exercise. Okay. Also uh, here uh, we are uh, including some illustration real data, US daily security rate time series for different periods. For example, testing a CKLS model. And you can see that in general, uh, the information that results are giving are quite similar on all different class of procedures. That means that if you increase the period of maturity, the, 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 the fitting is, is well, but of course, with small periods, uh, is not uh, fitting well. So, uh, well, we have another work where we work with the fitting uh, for the volatility, uh, using volatility, random volatility uh, in the model. But here with this model, it is more or less the result in this approach. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, other uh, uh, interesting application for a complex model is uh, for the model we will call a concurrent model regression. This is some kind of model related in the context of functional data. In this model, uh, we have a response y, a vector of covariates, and the y and the vector of covariates have the evolution uh, along of the time. Uh, Okay. Uh, there are two possibilities here that the, the data are observed in a, a regular instance for all curves. In that case, we can apply uh, the marking difference divergence. And uh, the situation when we have not observed the data at the same time, and that case is not possible at uh, this approximation, we have to use the conditional uh, uh, correlation. Well, so the idea is, for example, suppose that we want to test the significance of the different components of the, of the covariate. See, this is the new hypothesis that the mean of y of t 
conditional to some subset of uh, covariates is equal to the mean of y of t, this is the classical uh, knowing non parametric context significant test. And uh, we can use testing the significance of all the covariates, some subset, or independent covariates. Well, and then uh, uh, taking this uh, in mind, we can test then the hypothesis that the integrate of one of t of the corresponding marking a, a condition a difference is equal to zero versus not. So then this is clearly one possibility of to design one test. So the test is exactly the estimation, empirical estimation of the corresponding accumulate uh, marking a different divergence. Uh, and it's possible to see there is one paper in Anas 2018 for the, for the simple case of vector uh, covariates, not change with the, the time. And uh, it's possible to see the asymptotic limit distribution of the corresponding standard, standardized statistics. And also, uh, it's possible to see that the booster, particular way booster, is consistent for the calibrate the, uh, the corresponding event. Here is some simulation. For example, in this case, we could not find too many competitors. And not as in the previous case, we have different approximations. <coughs> we could not one procedure using empirical line, published in paper of one others in Journal Statistical Royal Society. And the other possibilities, a recent paper of these people, King, Mikey, Spike of the, the Northern Roman School. So then, uh, for example, you are working with one additive, non-linear additive model. Here is one example where we have these two functions in our structure. Uh, this is the functional covariance along the time t. This is the functions. And here is one example of uh, spatial covariance uh, along the instance. In this uh, example, t equals 25 space instance are observed in 2001, 2,000 Monte Carlo replications, and 1,000 boosters. Well, uh, uh, the behavior of, again of uh, this approximation using conditional, uh, uh, using a correlation distance, mapping a difference correlation distance, is working well in comparison because the, the procedures that uh, these people work are quite away from the reality. They are using the structure of the additive and then in their test they are using some kind of F test that is based in the structure. In the case that you are destroying this uh, structure, linear structure, automatically uh, they are losing the uh, level in the calibration and power in the, in the other. Here is uh, another example now, with, this is a, a data very well used, bike sharing rentals in Washington, D.C. Uh, here is the model that is considered where uh, the, the number of renting bicycles is function of some uh, meteorological variables in a non-additive way. Uh, here is the paper where this uh, example is motivated. And uh, the results obtained using the MPD approximation are quite consistent with other procedures using selected variables in this kind of assembly, for example, the SCAD. So, with respect to this second part uh, of the talk, we can say for this procedure, no model structure assumptions or estimation are applied. Non-timing parameters are given. We can implement global as well parcel tests, the asymptotic distribution we can be obtained, and also the, the consistency of the booster. So this kind of tool, the concurrent models, can be employed in a lot of different concurrent models approach, environmental issues, its study, financial, and also, for example, some people of our department 
are studying only the flu along all the years to have more or less this kind of more or less good approximation. Two minutes? Two or three minutes? Well, six minutes. Well, well then, uh, so I, I, I finish with uh, this uh, last point in the presentation. <coughs> Unfortunately, the, the pandemic was not enough time to finish all the parts, but well, we could see some advance. Well, but I prefer that pandemic was short. <laughs> <laughs> you see, of course, the situation of irregular concurrent models. Well, that is the case where we have not the observations in all curves at the same time. So we cannot use, of course, the previous approximation, and here uh, we use the conditional correlation to the approximation. Okay? So, uh, under the null, uh, in a similar way in the, in the previous part, uh, y independent of x gp, okay? versus not, and uh, we use exactly this integral as coefficient of the null hypothesis, now we have to estimate, of course, but now we have to estimate in a conditional way. And now the difficulties appear in the new statistic is not as clean as before, but because I'm using the weights corresponding to the kernel. The kernel always will be local. So in this part, to obtain a proper non parametric statistics to implement independent tests, a new statistics of order here. It's possible to implement also some kind of local wire booster. There are important problems in the computational aspects, very important problems. Also, it appeared as open the study of synthetic distribution of statistics and the discussion about the optimal boundary selection. I must say that I was not satisfied with the boundary selection criteria used in, in the previous paper because they are using. If I am not wrong, they are using the raw of land. <laughs> so then, it's a difficult problem, that I know. But, uh, oh well, also, of course, we are applying to uh, different real data sets. Thank you very much. Paper by Zeno, which, like, uh, which shows the equivalent of the Hilbert Schmidt independence criteria and distance covering. Since in the, in the end you talk about mild bootstrap, I mean, uh, is it like somehow related to the work of Tchaikovsky, uh, who, who shows uh, the mild bootstrap for, for, um, for the Hilbert Schmidt independence No, thank you for that. Uh, speaking about the equivalence, I am speaking about the different approximations using the, the line starting with the. In the correlation uh, different criteria and the using of the, the, the Hilbert's table okay. about the, the calibration the calibration must be made in, in, in the, the two approximations of course in some kinds for example compile distribution you can use permutations of other nice but in other more complex model, models the calibration is, is uh, other <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> like a kind of revenge, because you asked about the values, so I asked about the values here, and your student, the student talks about the values. No, it's, it's a joke, of uh, course. When you, when you recover, when you recover uh, the curve in your very last example, uh, irregularly, uh, irregularly uh, uh, sampled, probably noisy, uh, I, I suspect that. Uh, you, you should take care about how, how irregular the true curves are somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, at this point, there are two, two posters, just to make some, some advertising to, to some students, where you, you could learn the irregularity of the curves. And I suspect when you do your, the error, you want to control the error for, for smoothing the curves, you may, you may pick up uh, the, the optimal bandwidth to make this 
smoothing, recovering of the curve uh, negligible in order to be as close as possible to the ideal limit. Uh, yes, I, because I, in this case, of course, the last uh, application was the very difficult because you have many possibilities how you can have the irregular data, you can have sparse or you can have very concentrated. So and the way we depend a lot of the, the, this kind of approximation in the point of measure. Uh, we have a, we have with, uh, with a colleague that is in the room, Nicola. Uh, we have an estimate of the regularity of the true curves that you do not observe mm -hmm. in functional data. So then you could smooth in an, in an optimal way, but the optimal way may, in your case, depend on the purpose, which is the test, or even the power of your test. But in any case, you have a tool through this regularity of the curves estimator that you could put here. Well, it's just a yes, yes, because the, the, by my experience, the bandwidth is for the test using the uh, smoothing techniques, the, the optimal bandwidth is not well suited. I, I, I did not see We, 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 could, we, could we can speak, okay. but I think it's not well suited. In, in the session on, on, on testing for, for, for time series, I, uh, it was a little bit fast, so I'm not sure I understood correctly. So you, you mentioned that the epsilon d hat were converging to the epsilon d, but that does not imply that the statistic computed at the epsilon d hat converges to the statistic computed at the epsilon d. Yeah, you, you are telling about the, the estimation of the error. The, uh, the fact that you are, you, you are using uh, estimation, yes. That, that will hurt us. No, 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 not really. <laughs> we can speak like in the All right. Not really. I, I also listened a little bit about this time series. I'm saying you mentioned about the chef and just following up on the question from earlier. Um, so I think the result that we used for ASIC was that the, uh, we were quite convincing uh, on the time series. So we were able to have the result of the time is it the case in your setting that you have this convincing and um, that you're able to, let's say, find the links here that are fixing so you can instruct the environment to have no, no, for that? No, we did not have this convincing. Until the moment, we did not uh, consider the, the possibility of missing in our developments. Okay. But of course, this is, in that case, uh, maybe we have to make some kind of computation. I, I'm, I'm thinking more of the design of the chef variables which have to be correlated with a uh, mixing kind of just longer than the mixing of the time series. But in, in, in about the calculation of the boost level, many times you can use the multiplies because it's very simple. You don't need to repeat the procedure, only the, making some perturbation in the, in the approximation of the statistics. And this is very simple. Very important here about the, the So we, we are interested uh, so in these measures 
and in particular we are interested in the estimation of these measures. So the idea of this paper is quite simple. So what we try to oh, sorry, uh, so what we try to do is to char characterize these measures in terms of uh, copula uh, function and see how uh, this uh, copula function uh, can be estimated either like uh, semi-parametrically or parametrically and how this improves the, the, existing, the existing results, uh, estimation results. So that's, that's, the, that's the simple idea of the paper. Rewriting these, these measures in terms of popular function and then uh, considering different estimators of, of, this, of this popular function, so semi-parametric, uh, semi parametric, parametric, uh, sorry, parametric and non-parametric, and see how, how, this, how this improves the estimation results compared, compared to the existing uh, empirical estimator. So the, the outline of my presentation, uh, of course there is a pressure here to finish on time and, uh, and be on time for dinner, right? Um, okay, so, so the outline of my presentation, I'm going to start with the introduction, so motivating why, uh, you know, why we need this work. And then uh, uh, discuss, you know, uh, you know, the copula-based uh, health concentration curve and also what we call the Gini health index. Um, so showing you how we how we characterize this in terms of copula and then considering different estimators like uh, uh, based on different estimators of copula, uh, parametric and, and non-parametric. And then uh, studying a bit the, the asymptotic uh, properties of these estimators. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, looking a bit at the Monte Carlo simulation and see how these estimators compare with the, with the existing empirical uh, estimator. And then I will finish with uh, with an empirical application where we use uh, data, uh, US data, on uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen infection and death uh, uh, across states and see and and, and, and uh, apply these measures. To see how whether there is a whether there is a, an impact uh, of socio-economic uh, variables in, in like income, poverty rate, and uh, uh, ethnicity on on, on, on on the infection uh, and death uh, due to COVID, and then I, I will conclude. Right. So uh, of course, you know, I, I, I you know. I, I discuss, you know, the case of COVID, but these measures can be applied to different, uh, you know, problems. So, for example, uh, you know, you could look at, use them to look at how the, you know, the, the level of the income of family uh, affects some, uh, I mean, the concentration of some health variables like uh, sleep, sleeping habits, cigarette consumption, overweightness, etc. So, uh, and COVID. Uh, it's just a, a simple case uh, where these measures can be can be applied. So again, why we we are, we are looking at the, you know these measures in particular to uh, use them for, to, you know to look at uh, COVID cases because of what we just uh, uh, lived and we still like you know living this you know COVID uh, pandemic led to millions of infections and deaths, as we all know. And, uh, but also there is a, you know, uh, uh, an increasing interest to uh, know and understand how, uh, how different socioeconomic uh, uh, you know, uh, people I mean, like, uh, uh, are affected by, 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 uh, by COVID and infection and death, so whether there is some sort of uh, inequality on the way the COVID affects uh, people depending on their uh, socio-economic level and of course if that's the case how we should deal with that and of course that's a, a policy maker uh, uh, making issue uh, yeah so that's you know there is a rising you know lot of uh, newspaper uh, uh, newspaper articles that discuss uh, 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 that uh, Americans, are, in particular for American data, are equally at risk, are not equally at risk of infection and mortality from, from, from COVID. And also in Europe, 
there is uh, this report from World Health Organization that says that uh, uh, COVID-19 ex exposure risk and the severity of its, uh, of its health, social and economic impacts are not being uh, felt equally uh, across the European countries and sometimes uh, within the same, the same country. So yeah, that's uh, the growing you know, interest to look at this problem and, uh, and uh, of course there are you know, a lot of papers uh, trying to, to understand this problem, uh, address it and see whether there is any quality. But what we find, uh, uh, at least until we, uh, you know, we started to write this paper, uh, people are using sort of like regressions and correlation to understand uh, the inequality problem. So we, we believe, uh, maybe recently, there, I mean, there are some papers, but uh, in the, the time we start to write the paper, there's, we didn't see any paper that looks at this, uh, that uses these measures for, for COVID. And so, hence the interest of like uh, uh, looking at these problems and uh, the estimation of these measures uh, uh, in general and applying this to COVID. So, but again, this, as, as I said, so these measures, uh, health measures, they, they exist. People, uh, you know, propose some estimators. But so all that we do here is uh, we try to see whether we can improve. Uh, uh, the, estimation, the estimation of these measures. Uh, so in particular, we, we are interested in what, what is known as health concentration curve, but we also, uh, uh, to, the, to the index of this curve, uh, so the health, uh, for those who maybe are not familiar with this, so the health concentration curve uh, plots the, the cumulative percentage of the health variable against the cumulative percentage of the population that is ranked by some socioeconomic covariates uh, such as living standards uh, like income, poverty rate, etc. Uh, beginning with the poorest and ending with the richest. But we will see uh, uh, with some data here, like for example, when we use a poverty rate, so a low poverty rate means when, when the poverty rate is close to zero, that means we are like the you know so that that society is rich, right? So it's not necessarily starting from poor to, to rich, but it could be rich to poor. Uh, yeah. So the curve illustrates the effect of socioeconomic uh, variable on concentration of health variables such as COVID, uh, as we uh, as we do here. Uh, I'm going to skip this. So it's as we, I will show later. This this can be linked to uh, Lorentz curve. But the formal definition uh, of the health concentration curve is given by this uh, this formula here. So if we if we uh, define H as the health variable. Uh, so the interpretation of health variable. I mean, you could see like health variable like high value of uh, H as a positive thing or as a negative thing. So for example in COVID if H is high so the infection is high. Okay? Um, and then we uh, denote Y by a socioeconomic random variable that could be income, poverty rate, etc. And then uh, if we uh, define FY as the marginal distribution of Y then for p uh, between zero and uh, zero and one, so the health concentration curve is is, is, is given by this uh, this ratio here. So the uh, you know the cumulative uh, of the, the average uh, health variable, so conditional on on, on a on a on a quantile on the quant on a quantile of the of the socioeconomic variable. Uh, Yeah, so that's uh, trying to see if I can escape some. Yeah, so uh, here, of course, that's uh, as we will see in a minute. So this formula can be rewritten in terms of formula. So, uh, so the independence between H and Y is, is important for the estimation of this. Um, 
so it plays a crucial role for the calculation of the half concentration curve. And so, for instance, if H and Y are independent, then uh, the, the concentration health will be equal to the, you know, the line 45. Uh, so, uh, in that case, we are in the presence of perfect equality of health variable H across the socioeconomic variable, but uh, that doesn't mean a perfect uh, equality of the health uh, concentration. So, that's uh, linked to uh, uh, Lawrence. So, uh, so that's, that's the beginning, if you want, of the idea, so is to rewrite this curve uh, uh, in terms of popular function, so in particular in terms of the partial derivative of the popular function of the vector H uh, 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 income Y here. Um, and so now, the, as I said, the idea here is uh, we're going to try to you know, consider different estimators of the pop of this uh, derivative uh, popula and see how uh, whether there is some improvements compared to uh, to the existing estimator, which is the empirical uh, estimator. Uh, I think I will skip this to make sure that we can stay on time. So some examples, for example, if you have independence, as I mentioned before, then this curve uh, is just the P line or the 55 line. Uh, and in this case, uh, we are talking about, about perfect equality, uh, equality, but that's conditional to the socioeconomic variable. So, so this means that the socioeconomic variable has no uh, has no effect on the concentration of the health uh, variable. You could consider other type of dependence. So, for example, if you assume that H and Y are uh, uh, counter monotonic, uh, so then. Uh, so, for example, uh, the dependence between the two variables can be uh, modeled in this case as a cliché uh, uh, of thing uh, lower on copula. And in that case, the, the, the curve can be expressed in terms of 1 minus the, the Lorentz curve. Or the other example is uh, full monotonic. Then in that case, the, the, the curve can be expressed as a, a, a Lorentz curve. Uh, so now the estimation of the, the estimation of the uh, curve. Um, so the popular based representation. So we're going to use this uh, representation here for the estimation. And uh, so we're going to consider two two approach. So the semi-parametric, uh, uh, what we call the semi-parametric approach. So the semi-parametric. So we're gonna. Uh, so we need, of course, uh, as an input, the the distribution or the cumulative distribution of y, and also the the, the, the copula between uh, y and, and h, in, in addition to other uh, uh, quantities like the mean of, of h. So uh, so we consider so the semi-parametric uh, uh, approach here is to say that we combine uh, you know. Uh, we consider non-parametric uh, uh, estimator for the for the distribution of y, and then a parametric uh, uh, copula. Parametric. Copy. That's that's the first approach that we consider, and then the second one is we go completely uh, non-parametric. Uh, so we replace the copula function by uh, a Bernstein copula estimator. And then once we do the estimation of the uh, 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 the curve we use that to estimate uh, to, to you know to, to derive semi-parametric and non-parametric estimator of health uh, gene coefficient. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's more or less what I said. Yeah, so that's the I mean for the cumulative of uh, H we use this uh, empirical uh, distribution. So this is uh, again it's just. To, uh, to say that we have uh, data on y, on h and y, independent and identically distribution, so sample of it. And then, uh, so in the following, the, 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 the mean of, of the health variable is estimated using its empirical analog. And for the, for the distribution, the cumulative distribution, we use the empirical distribution. 
And then for the, the popular, as I said, we're going to consider both uh, a parametric and uh, a non-parametric approach. That's, that's what I do here, what I say here. So the semi-parametric estimation, so we simply uh, assume that the popular uh, of H and Y belongs to a parametric family of, of populus uh, with an unknown vector of, uh, of parameters. Uh, so theta here, the parameters of the popular, belongs to this set, uh, which is a compact uh, subset of R, uh, R Q. And then we consider, so that as you know, as you may know, there are several estimators uh, uh, for this parametric popular. So the, the, one of the popular ones uh, is, the, is the maximum pseudo likelihood estimator that, is, uh, that uses the mock likelihood uh, function for the popular density after you know, plugging in the, the, the empirical, uh, empirical distributions for, for the health variable and the, uh, and the, and the socioeconomic variable. Um, and then, of course, there are you know, a couple of papers that uh, looked at, uh, at the properties of these estimators and also provided uh, the, the, the asymptotic representation of the, of the parameters of the, of the popular uh, uh, function. Uh, so then what we do once we have that, we just plug in, uh, in the, in the in the, in the characterization that I sh showed at the beginning to obtain uh, a semi-parametric estimate of the, uh, of the curve uh, concentration health uh, curve. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I think I will skip this comparison here, uh, but we have in the paper some, uh, you know, uh, simulations where we compare, uh, I mean, for a given uh, simulation, not like a, like a Monte Carlo study, but so we show some graphs of uh, how this semi parametric approach uh, for the estimation of, uh, of CH compares to the, to the existing one, uh, which is the empirical uh, estimate that is given by this formula here. Uh, yeah, so we, yeah, anyway, yeah, I, think I, I can go this very fast. So, I mean, this is just one, one simulation where, like, we, we generate a sample of 100 observation uh, from Gaussian popular with, uh, you know, different levels of dependence, 0, minus 0, 0.99, and 0, 0.99. Um, and then, of course, we also need the distribution of H and, uh, and Y to calculate uh, the, the, these estimators. So we assume that these, uh, these are generated from exponential distribution. But that's again is just one. Uh, so I will show some Monte Carlo results uh, where, we we, where we properly compare these estimators. But just for one sample, uh, you know, what we see is that the empirical estimator uh, is not, uh, of, uh, as expected, is not smooth compared to the to the to the to uh, for example the semi-parametric one uh, either when we know the popular or unknown popular so unknown popular here is we just use some uh, you know algorithm to select the uh, the popular and then we we estimate them we estimate uh, that uh, uh, parametrically uh, so that's for like zero dependence then you know, counter monotonicity, uh, so the, that's a negative correlation. Uh, yeah, and so, but that's again one, one simulation here. Uh, for the non parametric estimation of the popular, so this, you know, the problem as, as, so as you know, the semi parametric estimation, uh, you know, uh, is based on, on, the, on, the, on the assumptions that we know the popular function. Um, so that in practice is, is a bit uh, problematic. So how we can solve that is, is, to, is, to, is, to, use, uh, is, is to use a non-parametric uh, non approach. And that's what we do. So uh, we, uh, 
instead use a, a, a Bernstein estimator for popular uh, that's uh, given by this formula here where this is the, the, the empirical popular and this, uh, this P is the binomial distribution function and this, this estimator uh, uh, depends on, 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 this, uh, on this quantity here M uh, so it's a, it's a truncation that, that plays the rule of, of, of the bandwidth and so we use that to get the derivative of the popular function because the, the, the characterization uh, of, the, uh, of the CH depends on the, uh, on the partial derivative and then once, uh, once we have uh, uh, an estimator of it that we obtain from this we can then use it to obtain a non-parametric uh, estimator of the, of the CH, the concentration health, uh, health curve. Uh, yeah, so we can then escape this. Uh, and then uh, we then uh, provide, as, as another measure, if you want, uh, of health that is based on the previous one, is the, is, is the index, uh, health index. Gini health index that is given by this formula. Uh, so all what we, I mean, uh, so we also provide uh, two estimators of this one. So based on the estimators of CH, uh, the semi-parametric and non-parametric. Um, yeah. So that's uh, so the Gini uh, the Gini uh, index here. So uh, if it's negative, uh, then then in, the, in that case we we are talking about a, a, a pro-poor health. So, the, uh, so what that means, so if you look at the, at the definition here, is that the, the CH curve is above the, the, the 45 line. And of course, if you rank, uh, if you rank your population from the poorest to the, to the richest, so then having CH above 45, uh, so that's... Uh, that's, uh, so that's a poor, poor health, uh, poor, uh, poor, uh, poor uh, health. And then if it's posit uh, positive, it's the opposite. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's what. Uh, so then we, so we use the previous estimators to provide the semi-parametric one and uh, and the non-parametric. How are you doing in terms of time? Um, so that's right. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, that's that's it uh, for the Gini uh, index. And then next, what we do is we look a bit at the, at the asymptotic properties of these estimators. And so I'm going to show the results for the for the CH. We're still working on the on the index results, but they can be uh, you know, obtained from the one from the uh, that we have for the CH. So we need some assumptions. Uh, so this assumption is uh, in fact uh, satisfied uh, as we can, uh, you know, as is shown here in these papers, particularly this one here. Um, so it's just to assume uh, this asymptotic uh, representation for the estimate of the, of the popular parameter. Uh, where this guy uh, so is, is given by, so you can find here the C, uh, uh, so we assume that uh, uh, so, we can, so it has a mean zero and, and, and uh, finite variance. Uh, so some notation, so that's the second derivative of, of, the, of the partial derivative of the popular. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, so using this notation, and so under this assumption here, an um, additional assumption, so in, uh, so in the paper, in fact, we have some additional assumptions uh, on the mean uh, of the health uh, of the health variable, we assume that it exists, and then we have uh, uh, a couple of assumptions on the smoothness of the, uh, of the popular function, and so under these assumptions, we have this uh, uh, asymptotic representation of the semi-parametric estimator that, of course, uh, 
uh, can be used, and that, that, that shows the, you know, uh, uh, the consistency, uh, so we can apply the part number and, uh, and the software limit theory for the consistency and the uh, distribution of, of, of this estimator. Uh, so the C here is defined by this term here, a complicated one. Uh, and then we establish uh, similar results for the non-parametric estimator, so uh, the, 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 the notation is a bit more complicated, so we have to define this term here. Uh, okay, so I think... Uh, uh, so that's what uh, that we use to, uh, you know, to establish this uh, asymptotic representation of the uh, non-parametric estimator, uh, the hair of you, uh, as, as, as you, you can expect, so the convergence rate here is, is, uh, depends on the, on the bending parameters, so M, remember that that's, uh, uh, the, that's the place the, bend, the, the rule of the, the bending parameter in the Bechstein popular. So now I'm going to move to the uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so, uh, you know, given that they have a few minutes, so what we do, we, we try to compare uh, uh, the integrated mean square error for the semi-parametric, non-parametric estimators that we propose here, and we, co we compare them with the, with the empirical uh, estimator that have been proposed in the literature. So we do that for uh, different uh, I would say different type of dependence uh, uh, between the health variable and the socio-economic variable. So we, we consider different popular functions like Gaussian student with different uh, level of, of, of dependence, and then Lighten, uh, 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 Gamble, etc. So, uh, and then for the, the marginal distribution, we consider uh, the exponential and uh, global distributions. Uh, and then, so that's, uh, uh, as you all know, this is the, 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 the integrated marginal uh, mean square error. Uh, so we do that uh, for different sample size 50, 100, 200. Uh, so as I said, we also, I mean, for the, for the semi-parametric approach, we select uh, we use this uh, algorithm to select the, you know, the, yeah, one minute, so, uh, yeah, to select the popular and then uh, estimate it, so, I'm get, so that's, uh, that's the results, so, uh, overall, overall, so the, what we find is that the, uh, the, the semi-parametric estimator is generally working uh, better than the empirical and the, the non-parametric one, um, and then so I mean, in terms of ranking the semi-parametric, and then is followed by the non-parametric, and then the last one is the empirical uh, uh, estimator, except for some level of dependence. Uh, 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 yeah. So that's the, the conclusion here for this one. So I have two 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 applications, but I'm gonna just. Uh, show one here very fast which is the you know we have one for the curve concentration curve but another one for the Gini coefficient so for the Gini coefficient so what we do we had uh, 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 you know we looked at data that uh, about 2777 counties uh, across 45 uh, US, US states so uh, we, we had data on the socioeconomic data on this uh, in, on, on, the, on these counties and also data on infection and uh, uh, death rate and so we do we did two exercises we looked at the uh, at the CH the cumulative uh, sorry the concentration health uh, curve but also to the Gini uh, index and I think it's more interesting uh, more, more interesting to show the Gini uh, the Gini. So the socioeconomics we consider income, uh, poverty rate. We also consider the like ethnicity, like the color, uh, etc. So let me jump to the graphs maybe here. So uh, so for example, so we, we have results for the semi-parametric and non-parametric. But uh, so this is 
uh, second is not biometric. So what we find is that across all the states, almost, when you consider as a socioeconomic variable income, then you have the Gini coefficient negative. So what that means, you have a, uh, in all the states you have a pro uh, 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 pro rich pro rich health. So that there is a there is a clear inequality uh, when you take uh, income as a, as a socio-economic variable. And that, this is confirmed what confirmed with the non-parametric uh, with the non-parametric approach. So except you like two states, but uh, other than that, uh, that's what. And then also, like we consider poverty rate. So the poverty rate here is the opposite. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. But then the problem is the interpretation. So, the, so how you interpret? It. So we thought about this one, and we, you are thinking about how to solve this. But uh, that's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, for this one, it's uh, so y is the univariate. Uh, multivariate, you could you know uh, com you know convert this to an index. But uh, the issue that we face is. Uh, of course, you add some uncertainty because it's generated variable, but uh, yeah, the interpretation is a bit uh, the issue. As a good American, okay, we did studies like this for the new car. The biggest question is the definition of income. If this is per person, then in this case the curve was U shaped. So this means that the, essentially the very poor and the rich were not dying. If you need as a per family, then in this case it was, it was increasing. Yeah? Because essentially, when you did it as a person, the issue was that those who had lots of children who were not dying, essentially became into the, into the worst category. Yeah? So in this case, we talk about the okay, income, it turns out a very important thing of okay, the economic There There were several studies, okay, and the government said at the end that he had enough. And he claimed that COVID is officially good. I agree it's important. So, but here what we do is, so here we consider, it's, a, it's an average across the county in the United States. So it's, it represents the county in a given state. Yeah. Okay, well, let's call it today.